you're probably quite busy at the moment. How's the how's the book promotion going? How's how's life and podcasting going? Oh, uh, oh, mate, it's been full on, but it's good, mate. I'm I'm loving it, and you know, I, I have to get this story out. Um, and uh, and then thank you so much for helping me to do that. So, mate, yeah, of course, I'm also preparing for my next expeditions and all. So it's been full on, buddy. Yeah, well, I need to give Dean Stott, a mutual friend of ours, uh, a big thank you for this introduction. Dean Stott obviously put hey, us in the- he's completely fine, Paul. He's completely fine. We good. <laughs> yes. Did I see, um, was it today or yesterday or recently, you were on the um, uh, High Performance Podcast with Jake and Damien. How was that one? Did you enjoy that? They've both been guests yeah. on my show. Yeah, mate. Yeah, it's, it was really good, and I enjoyed the full-on conversation with them. And uh, yeah, man, it was it was awesome. They had read the book and everything, so it made me a bit easier as well. Um, it was awesome, pal. I'm getting through it. I'm getting through yeah. it. My, my excuses are that my young children don't give me any peace and quiet. So I'm getting through the book. It is, <laughs> it is, a, it is a page turner. Um, but Nims, where are you right now? What's um, what's going on in your world right now? So I'm writing Nepal Kathmandu, and I am obviously doing the quarantine um, as for obviously the the law and regulations, and also of course in the you know, I have to be safe uh, and also in safety for the rest of the people. But equally, I'm obviously you know, busy with you know, the book loans and I'm preparing for my you know, next upcoming expeditions. So, yeah, it's full on, brother. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover a bit of ground. We'll, we'll go back and forth a bit. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you out here. I watched your Jay Morton live on Instagram. And he mentioned yeah. right, at, right at the end, he put it out there that you're going up K2 in the winter. Is that next or is that... Yes, buddy, that? yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of you know, where I'm, I'm working towards and I'm just working with a few sponsorship at the moment. And uh, as soon as those sponsorship you know, comes on board and, uh, and I think I'm good to go. But I'm just hoping, you know, the sponsorship will, will, will go ahead and then, yeah. yeah. What you've done and what you've achieved, obviously... You're, you're getting interviewed all the time. I want, take this wherever you want to go because I'm sure you're getting asked all the same questions, all the same bits and pieces. You know, let, let's take, take us on a journey. I mean, we, I know your story. I've done the research. I've followed you for a long, long time and many people will have. But yeah. going through the Gurkhas, growing up where you did, transferring to, S, to the, the Special Forces, your journey without even mountains involved, your journey and career and mindset is one that's exceptional, you know. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. And uh, as you said, you know, I have taken a lot of time to write that in the book. And I'm not sure, man, either the writing the book was the harder or the climbing part, man, because, you know, I, I really felt like once it's, you know, black and white, it's black and white. So I had to obviously, you know, you know, be very cautious of what I'm writing, but also equally, you know, I wanted to tell the story in a, in a manner that, it's just not a, a story, but people wanted to be enjoying it when, when you read the book. You know, it has to come with a full on roller coaster and all that. And I think I have done that job, buddy. I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, what has come through. Uh, I'm super excited, buddy. And I hope, you know, that the book will do well and kind of like inspire everybody else to, to you know, believe in, in themselves a bit more um, and in, you know, never stop dreaming. Uh, so that's, you know. What this is told me about you is that you're you talk about it in the book you talk about it on other podcasts and bits and pieces and things like that but you 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 seem to be comfortable with with death to the point of that you would never want or you said that you wouldn't want someone to risk their life coming to rescue you in the death zone you know yeah you know like you are absolutely right buddy because you know for me um if you are going on this extreme in expeditions or extreme sport you got to be, you know, self-sufficient. And if you are planning on something else, you know, it's, it's not good. And, and that what it does is, is straight away, it shows a weakness in you know, because, you know, you got to be rely on somebody else to see your life because you haven't thought enough about it or you haven't covered that aspect of the planning phase. So, yeah, uh, that, that's quite crucial in a part of, you know, how I run the expedition and for me, you know, it's not about like, you know, the ego and all that, you know, 
people we all have ego uh, but then you know like if you have the ego as a size of you know the door you can never get inside the room man so <laughs> stay humble you know like you know do what you can you know do do for you and and what it works for you but also going back into your question like imagine just because i haven't bothered and i haven't planned my expedition well there's someone who you know who have been you know, a risk their financial in you know, a situation you know, putting a lot of, you know, like effort to, to raise that funding to go on these bigger expeditions. And it's just so much hard work to, to kind of, you know, being prepared to climb a thousand days. And then they have to abandon the expedition and, and come and support me. I would never be able to leave that man. So everything has to be planned in depth and in detail, uh, trying to be, you know, fully um, self-sufficient and all that is a key to my everything that I do. You're so well known for, for you, yourself rescuing people from the death zone. <clears throat> What is it about the death zone that makes it so treacherous that when you're up there or if you do get in trouble, if, unless you are around or someone similar with your abilities, you're not going to survive? What is it about that, that height? So for those who doesn't know what the death zone is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an altitude, let's say from 8,000 meter, meter of an altitude, the human body is literally dying. No one can live over there. It's because the air is so thin that no one can survive. So the body is literally dying. And in terms of workload, if I have to explain, to, to carry for some people, carrying 10 kg could be like equivalent to like, you know, dragging a car at the sea level. That is like equivalent to the effort that you need. Again, depending upon the person. So yeah, the, you know it's, it's very challenging environment, and uh, you know you are literally you know dying for for a breath. You you will literally feel you know like not enough air to breathe as well. But for me, um, somehow I do pretty well, buddy. And uh, and I come from the Gurkhas, you know, from special you know forces heritage. I've never left you know anyone you know behind in the war, and I would never do that in in war but the situation is so you know leaving you know somebody on the mountain behind is, is you know not my kind of you know like you know of randy so yeah man um you know if there's and i'm there and i even you know, abandon my mission uh but it's also about knowing myself as well you know i'm not putting enough bricks that i don't know my own potential then i'm trying to rescue somebody else then i become the casualty and if somebody has to come and and, and if there's two casualty instead of one because i haven't done my homework then it's bad because the other person could probably save only one life. It's a very fine decision on, on every level here, buddy. So, yeah. Yeah. Then what I found, not shocking, but I was so surprised that you, you took to mountaineering late, you know, your late 20s, you know, and, and you had yeah, that. Yeah, when I was nearly 30 year old. <laughs> nearly 30 year old that you, you started looking at it. And am I right in saying when you, when you first went up Everest, it was when you took some leave from, from the Special Forces and they didn't know you were going? Oh, my, nobody knew that I was climbing in you know, Everest, not even my family, uh, like my brothers, they all, they live in, in, in England and all. But the only person who knew was my wife, because obviously I couldn't you know, hide and, and, and not pack, you know. Yeah. So I had to pack, you know, all this stuff. Plus also, you know, like I went to the bank and um, took, you know, personal loan uh, from HSBC saying that I'm going to buy a car. But obviously went on expedition and all that. So yeah, that was pretty, pretty cool, mate, because... I climbed Everest at that point, you know, in, in just 24 days without any prior, uh, prior acclimatization. Uh, but also in, this, in the book I have mentioned, I had a high altitude sickness, pulmonary edema. So I had a problem with my lungs because I was going so fast, you know, all crazy. So I had to spend roughly about 10 days within that 24 days to recover and then go back up again. Uh, but then on the way down, I, I saved someone's life from the death zone. And within four days of you know, summiting, you know, you know, the world highest mountain, I was, you know, back in operations, kicking door. And, and nobody knew about it, man. <laughs> so it was cool, I think. Have you always been like that? Have you, from, from your days as a boy through Gurkhas, the Special Forces, that if you get something on the radar, you're going for it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's the person I am. And, and, and um, as a kid, you know, I, I just wanted to be a Gurkha. And we're not allowed to get out of the, of the hostel because, you know, it's, it's a strict regime. And I used to wake up at one o'clock in the morning that I used to, you know, you know like, you know, sew metal rods on my, on my socks. And I used to go for a run. And I used to literally come at six o'clock in the morning and pretend I'm sleeping. I had never left the room. But then I was training secretly because 
you know, I cannot come with excuses saying that, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to train or I wasn't allowed this and that. Because if you really want that much, you can always make it happen. If there's a will, there is a way. So, yeah. And obviously you, you get the questions and you mention it in the book that people know you've come from the Gurkhas. You must have climbed Everest. Is that what was itching? Oh, is, yeah. is that what was annoying you? Oh, thought, I've man, got to get this that, ticked off. That killed me, man. People thought like, oh, have you seen Everest? I was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, you haven't seen Everest? You are from Nepal? I was like, no. Not everybody in Nepal sees Everest or it's in the back garden. You know, we, we, we had no privilege. You know, we, I was brought up in a really poor family. Then I went to school. Let live. If you have leave as well, you couldn't effort to go and you know trek for like 14 days to go and do this. So, but then when a lot of people start asking me, and I felt like, oh, I probably have to go and you know tick this box off, and and that's literally how it started. So yeah, buddy, it's never too late to start anything new in life. Well, you never know where where it's gonna end, you know. And then he, but the, the, your your story is is so you get told all the time, and the word inspiring and this that it gets thrown around a lot, but. To look at your story to find out that you didn't get into the Gurkhas first time. You had to deal with that rejection of something you'd wanted from childhood. That was tough, buddy. And it wasn't even like fair decision. You know, like, tell you, mate, there were like a lot of, you know, like young guys between age 18 and 21 came into this selection. Probably there were like around, I would say, 2,000 of young guys. And then there was a vacancy for only 25 people. So that was the passes. Out of 25 people, only 18 guys made it to the final. Only 18. And amongst 18, I was there. So I could have, I should be getting the pass, right? Yeah. Because I was yeah. 18 amongst like 25 vacancies to, to get to the final. Then there were like, you know, 26 of us, like, you know, people standing. And then we just say, okay, yeah, I don't like you. Uh, and And that was it. And like, so those 25 people and the number 26 got the, you know, green card and I didn't got it. So I was like, oh my God, this is so unfair. Just because he didn't like me, you know, but then again, life, you know, wherever you go, it will never be fair, but that doesn't mean you should you know, give up on trying, you know? Mm -hmm. So I went on the second time again and then I made it, man. What, what was know. that? What was that year like between failing and starting again and going for it again? What, what was your mindset? Mate, it was, it, it was tough, man, because, you know, I used to train with the friends and I was so fast. And even at that age, I was probably, you know, 17. I used to do, you know, like, you know, it's, it's mile and a half run in, in seven minutes, 15 seconds. I was still a kid then. Um, but then, you know, those guys who, who would never see me on the run and all, they made it through and I was the fastest, the strongest, and I didn't make it. But then... Sometimes, you know, just because you are the best, you know, you will always not get the justice. And sometimes you have to try again. It was hard, buddy, but I never lose my hope. No, and then when you, when you got into the Gurkhas and, and the, the military life progressed, at what stage did the um, Special Forces come into the UK, come onto your radar? Yeah, so for me, then once I served with the Gurkhas, I found out, you know, there is superior force than the Gurkhas. They are more elite. Then I found out, you know, UK Special Forces, you know, the SES, the SBS, and they were like saying, oh, it's like the James Bond stuff, and it's so cool. They are like the top dude. And I was like, wow, man. So there's like, so for me, whatever in life, I want to go, if I put my, my hands and stuff, or forget, I wanted to be the best, or at least try to be. So I was like, since I'm in the military, I want to be in the, in the top tier. So but it was hard, man, you know, coming from landlocked country to get into the SBS. And, and none of the Gurkha had ever made into SBS at that point. So it was quite a bit, you know, an alien to, to me. Then that means you know, I had to train so hard. I had to work extra hard and, and everything else. But then a lot of friends were saying that NIMS, you know, it's impossible. You can't, you know, you can't just go and do it. But then, you know, I didn't listen to them because it doesn't matter. You know, some of them were my instructors. Some of them were like my officers. Some of them were like who I really look, look as, a, as a figurehead, as an, as an admiration, like yeah. people who I admire. But then they don't know me as much as I do myself. I'm completely made from different clothes. What could be completely different wrong? So I believed in myself and, and I started working hard for it. I started training so hard, as I have mentioned in the book, my training resigned where... 
it's next level, mate. I, have, I don't think I will never train like that in my life. Um, and eventually made it, but it comes with, you know, hard work, you know, like relentless, you know, like of, 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 you know, like dedication, commitment, and giving 100% to now. So, you know, if you give all that, you will make the impossible possible. Where do you get it from? How do you constantly operate at that level? It's at the highest performance of, of everything you do is at that level where other people, myself included, will look, will look at you as I sit here and I, and I have found my way to get an interview and a conversation with you and I'm working where I can. But you and other SBS, Special Forces, these sort of people, the elite, they, they work there, they, they, they stay there, they operate there. And then we can take those skills to 8,000 meters where you're leading someone on the mountain or a team on the mountain. The pressure situation yeah. kicks in and you're the one they turn to. How, how do you yeah. stay there? How do you I stay think, there? mate, staying there, you know, like um, there is completely different. Like coming from special forces, you know, it's, it's a completely different mindset. Yes, the, the mental is there, but then... Uh, just being, you know, from the special forces, you know, climbing 8,000 is a completely different gig, brother. You know, nothing what happened in the military would, would really prepare because, you know, I had some friends from the special forces who had climbed with me and they were like, names, I don't know how you do it. And, and they, they both, in, they, they all work with us. But how do I don't know how you do it because I haven't recovered for two months or three months since, you know, you know I have climbed with you. So I think this was a completely different to, to what I did, but I did take away from, you know, from the special forces in terms of the decision-making ability and all that. But the normal thing here is, buddy, you know, what I believe as a human being, we all have our own talent, okay? We all have our own, own strength and weakness. So the biggest key message here is whatever you do in life, you got to love that stuff. You got to have love and passion for that. Once you find that, you know, like connection, then you got to work twice as harder. You know, you got to put your, you know, dedication. You got to put commitment, and with all the positive mindset and giving one hundred percent to that, then you become the, the the elite. And you know, we all are different. We all have different talent, but it's about recognizing that talent and and exploring it because you know some people are good at something else and some people are good at you know, something else. It's about you know, doing what you are good at and then training 10 times harder than every population in the world. And you can be like you know, the number one, I guess. What, what did the people above you in the SBS or your team leaders or anyone that was in your team, when it finally um, was announced or they found out that you had sort of sneaked away on leave and scaled Everest, what was the reaction? No, but they all were like, well done, mate, because, <laughs> you know, fair one. Uh, yeah. And you are here on time, you are on, on operations, and yeah, it's cool. And every, everybody was impressed, to be honest. Yeah. And, and what, what did that do to you? The fact that you got up Everest, how did that sort of set the, you know, it must have sparked something. Did you think, right, what's next? Where am I going now? Yeah, for me, like, um, I started my mountaineering career quite late. Then, you know, like in 2014, I started climbing you know, 8,000 meter peak for the first time, Dalagri, the world's seventh highest mountain. And at that point, you know, that's where I, I, I recognized that I'm different. You know, I'm like, I can go so fast. I was trailblazing like a 10 man. And I was like, you know what? Even at that point, you know, I never thought that, what I did last year was possible. I didn't even imagine it. So that was like complete. And, and that's why when I said I was going to climb 14 peaks in like seven months, everybody laughed because people couldn't imagine this is possible. And thinking back, I couldn't even imagine that until like 2017 when I climb, you know, uh, on, well, when I climb Everest, Lhotse and Makalu in five days. And that's like stopping for partying for two nights at Namche Bazaar and then running from Makalu Base Camp to to the road head in just 18 hours and that's like you know seven days worth of trekking six to seven days worth of trekking and that's when i realized wow climbing all this mountain having break for like in you know, a two days parting and then running to the road head immediately after the summit that's when i realized i probably can do something more here and that's when my my my, my kind of you know, limitation on on my imagination in terms of a thousand years got wider and that's when i started thinking about this but before man I couldn't even bought this kind of stuff. So yeah. Were you surprised with what your body can do with with how you quickly you can get up the mountain? 
But to, to be honest, um, I was I was a bit surprised, but I don't think I'm that superhuman, man. You know, I, I really don't think like I'm like a super superhuman. I think I'm still normal. Uh, but then I have got this mental resilience. Oh, it says connection is in, uh, unstable. Shall we pause here a bit? It's okay. You're all good. It's it's okay. Okay. I've still got. So shall we start from there again? Yeah. Um, you can. It's what did I say? Um. Are, are, are you yeah, we, we, we can start this conversation again and then we, we record and we, you know, so... No, it's all yeah. good. My, my editor will fix this in. I'll just put a note at the time, um, 20 minutes in. Now, Nims, when um, the speed that you go up these mountains, the speed you come back down, were you, when it first started, when you started taking on the highest peaks, were you surprised by how your body reacted and how quickly you could scale them? Yeah, a bit, buddy, because, you know, I wasn't expecting to be so strong and all because there were some other special forces guys who were climbing with me, right? Yeah. So I was like, okay, you know, we, we both have special forces, but then I'm going 10 times quicker. So I was like, okay, I had something in, um, but I didn't really feel at that time that I could do what I did last year. So it was kind of you know, like developing process. You talk about, or well, you talk in the book, and I know you're, you're big on this. But how strong you are mentally, that you your mind won't give up. Do you think that, as as a culture, as human beings, that we, we give up a lot earlier than we could, um, than we should oh, yeah. when we're trying to complete? Oh, mate, you know, like you are absolutely right. And I heard this thing, which is probably right or wrong. I don't know. You know, when you feel like you're gonna faint, as in the physical activities. They say you still got another like in you know, a 40%. So when I literally feel like I don't have anything, I'm like, well, I still should have 40%. You know, that's, that's something I believe in. And it works for me, man. So yeah, there you go. Do you know when you're scaling Everest or K2, do you know when your body's going to max out? Do you know when you've got to dig in? When you need to find that 40%? Can oh. you feel it? Can you feel it coming? Do you know when your team are going to start feeling the pain and the pressure? Oh, man, you know, like every step you take over there is, is, is a burner. And, you know, it's just a continuous, you know, voluntary pain. Uh, but then you've got to supersede with that something else. You just have to feel like, you know, you are on, on this, you know, massive mountain on the nature. You know, you are living on the moment. Of course, there's a pain of, you know, climbing up and, and it's so extreme. But then you know that all this pain is going to last forever. Mm -hmm. It's only temporary. And if you give up there, then, you know, you're going to, like, regret the the rest of the life so you know for, even for that purpose for just to avoid you know regretting and i keep pushing myself sticking on sticking on everest you took that famous photo of the queues <laughs> leading to the summit you took that photo and it went global it went worldwide did, did you know it would get sort of shared around the world as it did uh, no, I hadn't really thought about that, to be honest. And um, the number on Everest wasn't any different to what it was last year. But then what happened that season was there was no window and there was literally one day good weather window. And then people have paid so much money. People have you know, worked so hard with the acclimatization rotation. And of course, everybody wanted to go for the summit. And, uh, and I took that, that picture for a completely different reason that I couldn't break my world record because I was stuck in traffic, but then the world kind of made the fun of it, you know, which I wasn't happy, man, because you know, it's still not a tourist mountain because you still have to go through the dangerous, you know, Kumbu Ice Fall. Nobody can, you know, take you to the summit of Everest. Nobody can carry you. You still have to go through the, the most like, you know, like, you know, 60 degree, you know, let's say wall. It's a mile and a half kilometer, a mile and a half, you know, in, in terms of lengthwise. Then you go to the death zone and you got to climb Everest. So it's, it's still not a joke. And, uh, but then people, you know, who have never climbed and all that, they started making like Mickey out of it. Everybody else. Well, don't say that if you haven't been there. Just because everybody is in, in the ring fighting and there are so many boxers coming out, so many MMA fighters coming out, that doesn't mean you could be one of them. It's a different thing, you know, so... Don't judge whatever it is if you haven't been there. That's all my request. I can say it to the people. I love your passion on that. I've heard you say that before. And I mean, I, I have certainly never been to Everest. You know, I don't know if I'll ever make or do something like that. But it is so many. It, you hear it often from people that just they don't know what they're talking about. The way you, uh, yeah, the way I mean, you describe it is how dangerous it is. 
Um, but then moving from Everest, can you tell me, that when we look at K2, what makes K2 so dangerous? And, and was, was that the most dangerous mountain that you completed in the 14? You know what, brother? I'm going to be brutally honest. If you remove all the logistic power, all the spare parts and all, Everest is harder to climb than K2. Okay. And it's, it's not only me who agrees, even me and Reinhold Messner, we agree at the same point. You cannot even climb through Kumbu Ice Fall. Forget that, you know, like, you know, Camp 3 and all that. Mm -hmm. So, but then you remove all those. Uh, well, if, if you talk how it is, because, you know, K2 is not as popular as Everest and, and people go to K2 with a, with a small number and all. The reason why it be, becomes hard is because, you know, the unpredictable weather, weather conditions. You know, it's still it's steep. It's a bit you know, technical. But in terms of dangerous, it's, it's not even as dangerous as, as Everest, if I'm being honest. Yeah. And, and I have been in all of them. So here is the right, you know, like black and white answer. Yeah, you're the man that knows. You're definitely the man that knows. <laughs> when, when, when the days were hard and the, the mornings were maybe slow or people were in the wrong energy was at base camp, but you had to summit and you had to sort of get the right team together, get your, get your squad ready and motivate <laughs> and tell them what's going to happen to the point that you even had to head up, trailblaze it and set the ropes. What were those yeah. mornings? What were those morning lights like when people that were on your side were actually saying, "Nims, maybe we don't do it today." Oh man, you know what? You know, like uh, for example, um, specifically on K two and all, I, I got into K two base camp, and ninety five percent of people had given up. Five percent were there thinking me and my team would come in and set the fixed lines. Uh, but I wanted to go to Broad Peak because Broad Peak is is one on the list to tick off and. The line was there. It was people had just submitted a couple of days. That means you know the snow is is compacted. That means it's easier for me, and it will make sense for me to go and do that. But then I realized people had the hope in me and my team. So I was like, how can I let their hope die? So I just changed my plan and I decided to go and and fix the lines on K2, and it it was a team effort. Of course, you know I had my incredible team, and uh, I cannot obviously go ahead and 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 the project of this nature would, would never be successful without a hard work from from all my team members and that's not only you know those you know those guys you know who had the boots on the ground uh, but also you know equally from you know like my wife at home and those people who, the sponsorship everybody who donated by GoFundMe page and all that so I think the whole project was wasn't my project mate to be honest it was people's project and um and then it was for the people. So that's why when I went to K2, I felt like, you know, the, the people were, you know, hoping that. So we went and we set the fixed lines for them. And within like, you know, summited, straight down to base camp, we parted for like pretty much whole night and then went to the summit of Broad Peak. No yeah. stop there. Uh, need, but it was need, epic, brother. You need to tell me where you got your, uh, your ability to party through the night and get up the next morning and go again. Is that... Uh... A secret of the SPS or the Gurkhas or hey. where did you get it from? Mate, that's Nim style, brother. Nim you know? style. Never, never tried it at the best camera high altitude. You know, you will regret it. It's, but it's incredible <laughs> the way you can do it. You're, you're famous for it. You're famous mate, for it. You know, yeah. But for me, man, you know, like, why you want to be so serious? You know, what I mean, I can, I don't need to be. Serious, yes, of course, the mission is big, but then why you got to tell everyone with your face you are like so nah, man? You know, you started to get serious as soon as you put the crampers in your suit and as soon as you, you, you climb. But the rest of them, you know, you still want to be happy. And you know, I want the boys to say whatever they want to say, and, and, and we want to chill and all that. But, but then, are we talking like a full on night on the town or night in base camp? Or are we talking a couple of beers around the fire, ready for the morning? Mm, yeah, well, no, we, we, we do full on night sometimes. You go like, full on. Proper on. Yeah. Um, when you assembled the squad, when you thought, I can do this, the previous record, seven years, seven to eight years, I can do this in seven months. When you calculated it, when you looked at it, where did you start? How did you, who was your first yeah. person or your go to? Yeah, so I, I, so so I, I Google it and it was seven years, 11 months and 14 days. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I climb every slot in Makar in five days. Let's give them the weather factor. Let's, you know, take the, the funding issues and all. I could probably finish all this in like four months, but I feel like, you know, I got to do within, I, w I have to say within seven months because then, you know, there could be like more, more like first factor, mm -hmm. like, you know, the politics. 
fix the funding and all that. So yeah, man, it was epic. Uh, but again, you know, like my team members, you know, I, I had to run a kind of a mini special forces selection on, on our first peak. That's why we pick Annapurna because it's the hardest and most dangerous to climb. And the team selection was done. Some of the guys I had knew already before and all. And we're like a family, man. We're like a brother and everybody failed the vibe and everybody was part of the team. They all had the opportunity to climb these new mountains and also, you know, like their names are up there. And they all are getting, of course, you know, mentioning the book and all that. So I think it's happy for all of us, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's, it, it sounds and it looks and everything that I've read is the, the, the team ethos of follow you, but, you know, they will follow you anywhere. You know? Yeah, my, they, they are like my brothers, we are family, but then, you know, it's, it's all about the, the true leadership, you know, as a leader, you should not only be able to lead from the front, but also you've got to have the, the values and, and also like the team also need to benefit from that. It's, if it's all about me, 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 man, it's, it's never going to be successful, man, mm -hmm. because you know, it has to be about the team as well. So they got a lot out of this as well. And as I said, you know, they were only not climbing these mountains, but they were also getting paid as well. Imagine I was like, I was getting paid to climb in you know, all these things and not to worry about the sponsorship. So everybody was laughing and all that. So it's, it's happy, man. It's, it's happy stuff. Did, did it change some people's opinions when you announced that to do this, you were going to leave the SBS? Because you couldn't get the leave to do the whole mission. When you decide, nah, bro, you you will never get that. It was too risky and all yeah. this next level stuff, man. So it will never get you know through the through the defense. So yeah, yeah but, and then the reason why I I I left the whole thing was my this project was never about me or my family and all. It was it was bigger than that, and that's why I, I told my mom you know when I was looking after my mom and dad, literally sending you know a part of my pay uh, cut and then send that money directly to home. But then all that is stopped when I when I left the the service for this project and all, and it it, it wasn't for us, man. And our family, and me, and all is was bigger than you know this this project was bigger than anything else. And I felt like it was it was a you know a project of a human race. That's what I believed in, and then that's why I was able to do this you know bigger stuff. Yeah, and then approaching sponsors, there was resistance because people thought this isn't possible. You, you can't, you yes, can't mate. People, people thought this wasn't possible, firstly. And second, mate, it's so risky, man. If, if something, if NIMS died, then they will probably feel like, oh, we are partly to blame. And that's the reason why many people like, you know, one, they didn't believe it massively, 90%. And 10% who believe probably were like, yeah, if, what if he dies then, you know? So it was like, and also people were like, NIMS who? Because I had no Instagram, I had no Facebook, I had nothing in you know, 2019, beginning of that year. And we we haven't even heard about him. Bear in mind, I still had like three world records while I was still in Special Forces. It, it was just quiet, mate, you know, because you know, I couldn't come onto the press and talk about it. But then people were like, Nims who? Who is that, you know, like bird or whatever it is? I haven't heard about that name. So, but hey, hey. Was that fuel for you, though, when people said no? When people said you can't do this? Was that just... No, nah, I wasn't trying to... No, nah, I was like, okay, fine. You know, so what? You know, it was a bit disappointing, buddy, because, you know, yeah. you go with the hope and all, you meet meetings and meetings, you do so many... Meeting after the meeting, meet so many people, then at the end, you know, your expectation is not met, you know, everybody's turning down. It's, it's actually demoralizing, brother. <laughs> but yeah. hey, again, you know, yeah. You, you use that mindset that you've got just to keep pushing. Nims, yeah, because what you've yeah, done, it's, it's put a lot of things on, on the map and it's put a lot of, um, a lot of the, the, the things that we do as humans that damage our world, you know, you're clearly trying to protect our world, you're, you're putting good things in front of people for us to notice and to, to, uh, to yeah, for us to start paying attention more. Is there things that we do as humans that disappoint you, maybe up mountains, around mountains for the, the great outdoors and the wildlife? Uh, no, I think, you know, what I believe in is like, there's no race. There's one race as a human race now. And, um, you know, before we talk about all this stuff, small stuff, you know, like the religion, the caste, the, all, I think it's, we got to think bigger than that. The human has survived until up to date because of you know, how intelligent we are. We need, to, we are always adapting, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's time to adapt now because, the world is, is, is with, the, with the climate change and, and global warming. I felt like, you know, if we don't act now, if we don't come together as a human race, we probably not, you know, survive this, you know, like, I don't know, the, the major thing that's going to come in 10 years time. 
So I, I really feel like right now, we as a human being, whatever we do, as long as we kind of, you know, like, it doesn't have to be big, man, but it, it could be literally some small thing as like, you know, turning the electricity off when you are not in the house and all that. But whatever you do, putting, you know, our earth, our home into our mind and then trying to be more eco-friendly uh, in order to run a, a sustainable biodiversity um, in, in, this, in this world. And as long as I think people started thinking about this, the bigger challenge that some of us even, even haven't re realized. And, and hopefully, you know, a lot of people will start thinking onto this one and we come you know, get together. And, and it's not like one man cannot do, do any, any difference on this one, but if we all unite together and if everybody start doing little things, we can make a huge difference. So hopefully, man, uh, everybody will be more kind of like, uh, you know, yeah, loving to that. The, the other thing you've done is, is you've really you've really opened up sort of the world to Nepal and you put it on the map, but the, the Sherpa community that's there as well. What's that, yeah. what's that lifestyle like for the Sherpas? What, what, what is their day to day when they're trying to summit Everest and, and things like that? Well, you know, like the Sherpas are the frontier of a thousand years. They have always been and, and they are like hardcore, you know, mountaineer. And uh, I'm so humble and so glad to be representing the Sherpas, which is the Nepalese climbing community. Um, and uh, I hope, you know, like through this project, you know, a lot of people also get, are getting inspired. They, they are looking at me as like, oh, we can also be sponsorship, you know, like sponsor athletes and all that. So it's positive, but for us, you know, like right now with pandemic situation, like everybody else in the world, uh, most of us rely, you know, for, for the year's whole income on, on Everest and on all these big mountains. But having all this cancel, you know, like a lot of in our climbing community is, is going through really tough time. Um, hopefully, you know, this pandemic will, will end soon and we can, you know, get back to our happiness and get back to our normal life. So in, in Nepal at the moment, you're in isolation because you've just traveled there or is the country on lockdown? Yeah. No, I, I just travel here, buddy. So I'm, I'm in isolation and I'm just following the rules uh, because, you know, I, I have to. It's for everyone's safety. So, uh, yeah, it's not a nice thing, but you have to do it, buddy. Yeah. Fitness-wise, Nims, just to be ready at the base of a mountain to know what you're going to take on, do you ever go to gyms? Is everything outdoors and adventure training, or how do you condition yourself? Mate, just to give you an example, I never trained for a year last year when I was doing that project. Nothing. So 2018 was full-on write-off because without funding, I couldn't, I couldn't go on the project. And every second I had, I had was onto the, onto the like writing emails and all that. So, mate, I was born fit, no? That's what you know SF does. Born fit. I love it. I love it. That is um, that, that should be your next book. <laughs> yeah, Born but but fit. you know, like but when <laughs> Born fit. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, cool. but, but there must be something in that though, that the, the fitness for the mountains. You know, it's it's different. And your ability to go up, as you say, people will go up with you and three months later they, they can't they still can't operate their legs, they're still tired, they're still knackered. You get to the bottom. You run that distance and you go again. I know you say born fit, but is do you think genetics? Do you think you know something through the family bloodline? Look, uh, look. I grew up in 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 the western part of Nepal. I grew up, you know, like in in you know the altitude of you know five hundred meters. So it's no different to like you know Samani or any 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 you know basin Alps. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I do have definitely some some genes um, that I'm able to climatize quicker. But then. For me, I have fun while I do this. I'm so excited. I'm so happy. And, and happiness is what? It, it supersedes everything. If I'm always grumpy and like, for example, someone who loves running, it's okay for him to run like full marathon. But if there's someone who hates running, it's going to be a nightmare. Equally, if somebody is like who loves playing football, he can probably do full marathon in, in the football like the court. But then if you make him run because he's not happy, I think the whole thing about this is you got to be happy in, in what you do. And as long as there's a happiness, there's joy, and there's like, you know, this kind of you know, living in the moment, all these pain things will just go away, brother. Yeah. <laughs> then diet and food. What, how much, you're doing the mountains so quick. Are you trying to keep everything as light as possible when it's on you? What are you taking with you, supplements-wise, uh, food-wise, to get up mate, and down? It, I had never taken any supplements and I have never taken any energy gels or anything else, bro. I just live on Nepalese food, dalbat. 
it's rice and you know like curry and that we get it's pretty basic right? but yeah i haven't i haven't taken anything like you know any any supplements um but maybe because i'm i'm still young brother my body still functions well and maybe when i get old maybe i have to take those vitamins and all that but i don't rely on that at the moment yeah and are, mount, are mountains going to be you forever or do you have your eyes you're probably not going to tell me or, or anybody what what you might look at but what have you tried or what have you tried and you didn't like what have you sort of thought maybe i can do that to an extreme level no, I don't think like I don't think mountain will. Nothing is permanent in life, and 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 I'll be wrong to say that this is it. So I think this is stay open. Um, as long as there is like joy in, in what I do, as long as I love it, and I, I always want to be like, I at least give one hundred percent to be the best, and and we see, buddy, where it leads. And what what about your your fellow well known sort of former SAS, SBS, Jay Morton, Dean? And all those have, have you gone to the top of these mountains with any of those guys? I know they've done it individually, and Middleton's been up um, and things like that. Have you climbed? No, I haven't again? done like you know, like well, I haven't like really to be honest. I have climbed with like not literally together, but I have climbed with Jay, I have climbed with a few other special forces guys, which I cannot name it here. So I, I have done a bit with the boys as well, yeah. And am I right in saying that Ant was actually really supportive of the challenge? My aunt is like my brother. He is such a good guy, and he has always been like like my brother to me. And and he's probably only the one sponsor who said, "Okay, man, there is a money that I can put into your project. I don't want anything. No hashtag and middle though. Like you know, I did it for because you know it was pure. Um, and his sponsorship is a gift, and and he gifted me that. Uh, so I was super happy with that. Um, yeah, he's, he's he's a great dude, and he's a great friend, and and we always laugh about it. We yeah, when we are together, mate, we bring some some serious, you know, happiness. And I bet there's a few beers as well. Oh, always, bro, always. Nims, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate your time. I know you're going through lots of promos and stuff for the book. As, <laughs> as I said, and here it is. Um, I'm getting through it. I'm enjoying it. It's fantastic. It's inspiring. Um, and congratulations for everything you've achieved. And thank you for for making time for me. Yeah, mate. Thank you. And and. Uh, the key message from the book is buddy you know like i i was very you know unfortunate i was i grew up in a really poor family i was underprivileged in a, a poor kid in nepal then from there to joining the gurkhas you know failing for the first time then making it eventually then going into the special forces and doing what you know the UKSF does and now in being into this 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 crazy really amazing project last year uh, what is source to the world is, you know, you don't need to have a, have a rich parents. You don't need to have an opportunities. You know, we as a human, as long as you believe in yourself, you can create your own opportunities. You have to put hard work, dedication and commitment. It has to be always there. You shouldn't even think about it. And as long as you do those, you know, you can achieve the impossible. And, and I think that's the key message. And, and hopefully everybody can relate through you know, every problems that they are going in their life. And uh, hopefully they will be able to climb their own mountains. So, yeah, buddy. Well said, Nims. It's awesome, and I'm getting that from the book, so thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. You take care. All the best. Thank you. All right, buddy.